everyone. Welcome to another Thursday night with LumCon. We hope that you had a great week um, and things are going well for you. And uh, we're looking forward to talking about some fish with you tonight. So for those of you who are new to the audience, you'll be able to communicate with both me, uh, Dr. McLean, our executive director, and tonight's featured speaker, um, Dr. Kelly Boyle. Uh, using the question box. So you should be able to see in your dash in your dashboard the, the question box. Feel free to use that at any time uh, to either, you know, join in the conversation, offer opinion, however you <laughs> Thank you, Tori. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it kind of threw me off. So feel free to use that if and for practice, every week I have something for you to respond to. Last week's joke went over really well. So Kelly, oh, did it? Are you sure about that? And well, <laughs> the audience the audience responses went over very well with me. <laughs> I don't know if the joke actually went over really well. So Kelly, I'm going to direct the uh, question to you. But audience, feel free to chime in with any answer you th you think is the best answer to this question kelly how do you communicate with a fish <laughs> i'm gonna stray away from tonight's kind of topic fin language maybe if, you're, if we're not using sound <laughs> i'm guessing is that i don't know <laughs> that's a great answer um the joke site says drop a line. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> why, why do I so feel like you just funny. have like a joke book that you bought like in a dollar general that you're now just pulling? You've been you've been holding on to this thing for like decades and now like is your time to shine? Yeah, it's something I've always wanted to use professionally and just never <laughs> have been. <laughs> I'm glad LumCon can provide that kind of opportunity. <laughs> it's not true, y'all. I got it off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I you wrote that considering one. <laughs> maybe, maybe I wish that were true. <laughs> <laughs> so our audience seems to be pretty quiet tonight. Are you all awake? Oh, there they are. Oh, they're coming in now. Let's see. We got right. speech bubbles. <laughs> Great, Mary, thank you for that one. Uh, oh, let's see, Electric Eel Company from Jonathan <laughs> to the Fish Guild. Oh, David Weehunt, don't quit. He says, don't quit my day job. <laughs> uh, tough, tough crowd. <laughs> Wait a minute, this technically is your day job. <laughs> Lee Hunt, that's right. This is my job. You heard it from my boss. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bubba says gill phones. <laughs> All right, y'all. You're much better at this than I am. So I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. And I'm going to turn it over, <laughs> over to Craig. Thanks, guys. And I'll see you on the other side. Thank you so much, Mer. I'm again, Craig McLean. I'm the executive director of LumCon, and it has been my pleasure to host this ongoing online series that occurs every Thursday night. Um, you can find out more about our future speakers by going to the lumcon.edu webpage. If you scroll down there, you'll see a link that'll take you right over to the uh, seminar series. I want... Uh, you might notice that my background has changed. I'm actually in my lab. Um, that's a giant isopod. Oh, wrong sign here uh, over my shoulder and uh, that named Gertrude. Um, as you can see, we're back. We're trying to get back into operations. We're allowing 50% of our staff back in and we're rotating through and trying to kick back up. Um, it's a very exciting time for us at LumCon. We're ready to get back to it. Um, that being said, we're gonna, we have intentions to continue this online lecture series. It's been a lot of fun for us, a lot of fun for our speakers, and I hope a lot of fun for you at home. Um, it is my, uh, my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Kelly Boyle, uh, Assistant Professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of New Orleans, uh, 
since just 2019, right? So you've only Correct. been there yeah. a year? Yeah. Um, Less, little, yeah, just. And then it was, and then it was like, welcome to the coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that uh, it's gonna, it's gonna get better. We're all gonna get better. We're gonna get through That's this. That's right. That's right. Um, Kelly was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of South Alabama and Dolphin Island Sea Lab, uh, and before that, a postdoc at the French National Museum of Natural History in Paris from 24, 2014 to 2016 and also a postdoc at the University of Liege, is that right? Uh, in Belgium? Liege. Liege. Uh, and um, he received his PhD from the University of Hawaii in 2011. And Kelly's research is focused on functional morphology and ecology of sound producing fishes and fish hearing. And we are very excited to have you talk to us tonight, Kelly, we're very much looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Craig. It's really a, an honor to be here. I'm really looking forward to, to chatting with you all. Let's see if I can figure out the technology. <laughs> all right, let's talk about talking fish. So uh, uh, a little over over 50 years ago now, uh, the Silent World uh, book, hey, and then uh, Kelly, I'm community. sorry to break in. We're not seeing your presentation yet. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm maybe I'm not sharing it. What do I have? Uh, let's see. So up by the microphone, you should have a sharing my screen. Or you, or you can go to the sh the show button. Okay, uh, I just did something. Do you see anything yet or no? Uh, just you, so you yes, need to yes. share your screen uh -oh. again. <laughs> <laughs> we even practiced this, believe it or not. I, I failed the first test, so apologies. Okay, sharing. There it is. There it is. All right. Success. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> Thank you for walking me through that. So <laughs> hopefully I won't make too many more <laughs> too many more tripping up. Yeah. So let's uh talk about talking fish. So uh over 50 years ago now, uh, uh Jacques Cousteau's The Silent World kind of really popularized uh what life is on under this under the seas for a lot of members of the public and um the the name it turns out uh in retrospect the silent world is is pretty misleading because what we now know is aquatic systems marine systems ocean systems are are often not silent and quite dynamic with the kind of sounds that you might hear so there's natural sources of sound in the ocean like waves and rain, uh, earthquakes and seismic activity can be putting out uh, sound in the ocean, uh, movement of sea ice and breaking of sea ice is a source of sound. And besides uh, physical sources of sound, there's also numerous kinds of biological sounds. So sounds um, often from activity of, of animals. So uh, what I'm showing here um, are uh, two figures that you'll see this kind of figure throughout the talk, uh, spectrograms that show um, a, the pitch of a sound or the frequency of sound over time. And so the horizontal axis up here is about 48 seconds worth of sound. And if you move up on this uh, axis, you go from low to high. And this is a recording of a bottlenose dolphin whistle in Alabama, because um, as, as was mentioned previously, I used to live in Alabama, and you could just put a hydrophone off the dock and you'll frequently hear Atlantic bottlenose dolphins as you uh, can also in, in Louisiana if you have an underwater microphone or hydrophone. So 
hopefully you could hear that. That's the, the top sound. That's a sound of bottlenose dolphin whistles. And you also might have heard some clicking in the background. And the figure below shows echolocation clicks. These are um, kind of two sources of sound from the same animal. One is a social sound that they use to communicate with one another. And uh, one is a, a type of biosonar that they use to sense their environment. So there's all kinds of examples of animals that produce a lot of noise in the ocean or sound in the ocean. Other marine mammals like humpback whales. Uh, this top figure of a humpback whale um, is a recording that I made as a graduate student uh, on the Kona coast of Hawaii. We were trying to get fish sounds, but in winter months, um, if you're in the Hawaiian Islands, you, you'll often hear sounds of male humpbacks. And these songs are uh, associated with whales that are present there uh, in winter months that migrate from uh, waters off the coast of Alaska. And um, a more ubiquitous sound or sound that we hear every day in reefs around the world and shallow nearshore areas are the sounds of snapping shrimps, which are small uh, crustaceans that produce a really loud sound. And there's many of them in these habitats. And I'll play that sound really quickly. Hopefully you can hear it through my uh, computer speaker. Uh, if not, imagine the sound of like frying bacon. So um, the, the point is there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different kinds of sound in the ocean and uh, different habitats and different times of the year have you know, varying degrees of these kinds of sounds. So it's not a quiet, silent world. Um, and fish are also part of this kind of noise environment or what we refer to as a soundscape. Uh, some of the sounds that, that, that fish um, add to this soundscape around us in, in the ocean are incidental sounds, sounds that they make that are probably not part of communication, but things like animals feeding. And one example of this on coral reefs is of parrot fishes. And I'll play a quick video of um, a bullethead parrot fish now. Hopefully I can share this correctly. And the video, you'll hear a bit of a hum, which is a camera noise, but what you're gonna listen for is a scraping sound. And these fish have a beak-like mouth that they use to scrape algae off of uh, dead coral. So they actually scrape the dead coral and remove the algae that they feed on. And this makes a, a very loud sound. I'll have to escape presenter mode. So hopefully you could hear that uh, that that scraping sound um, associated with those fish feeding. So a lot of sound is is present in the ocean, and one thing uh, that I find uh, surprises a lot of people that are maybe not so familiar with fish is that fish have ears. So you don't see an external ear on a fish, and fish don't have a middle ear, but they have an inner ear. So like us, they have, they have inner ears. They just they lack a middle ear or external ear. And ears are actually present in the oldest lineage of, of fishes, the jawless fishes, really the oldest group of vertebrates, lampreys and hagfishes. And in all vertebrates, the ear has a fundamental role of providing information on how, uh, how animals balance um, and, and how they move their head, they, they, sensing gravity, sensing up and down. Uh, but 
it's hypothesized that hearing sound um, has evolved as a, a byproduct of having these balanced sensing organs. It's um, given rise to uh, an ability to sense uh, a more distant motion from a sound wave. And so fish have a sense of hearing as well as a sense of balance. So they use their inner ear for balance. And this figure here on the left is a drawing hey, of hey, inside. Kelly, I'm sorry, I, um, your presentation's not up. Oh no. Okay, thank <laughs> you for thank you for telling me. No problem. That's great. Thanks, Kelly. You can see it now. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, this uh, image on the on the left side of the screen is a uh, a reef fish ear from a, a sergeant major uh, damsel fish that Karen Maruska drew in in um, a, a study on hearing in this species. And um, what we're looking at is the brain of the fish. And right here, hopefully you can see my arrows. These circular structures are the semicircular canals of the ear, and these are present in, in humans as well. Uh, fish ears are different than mammalian ears in that there's no cochlea. So hearing actually takes place in uh, these pouch-like sense organs um, uh, that are located in the ear of the fish. And inside of these organs there um, in bony fishes are large um, or sometimes large calcareous structures called otoliths or ear stones. And that's what these are ear stones from, uh, from Drum from Louisiana actually. Uh, and these uh, heavy structures sit inside this pouch. And this figure uh, on the right side of the screen uh, is a electron micrograph from uh, Popper's study in 1976, looking at hair cells in the ears of a fish. And these hair cells are responsible for actually responding to motion in the ear. And because a fish is, uh, similar density to the water that it's swimming in, if it's close to the sound source, even many meters away for a loud sound, the fish is actually going to be moved by a sound wave. And this heavy otolith lags behind and it actually moves these hair-like structures, these cilia and the hair cells. And these things um, actually send a signal to neurons in the um, eighth nerve of the fish that's, that relay hearing and balance back to the brain. And so that's um, a simplified explanation of, of how sound gets to the brain of a fish. So fish are, are actually hearing different kinds of sounds. And um, many, many people might be curious, hopefully, how, how we might test hearing in a fish, because that's not, not um, essentially um, straightforward right away. And one common method that, that I've used and that uh, many others have used that is a way to kind of approximate the hearing sensitivity of a fish is called um, auditory evoked potentials. And these experiments involve anesthetizing a fish and um, restraining an anesthetized fish in a chamber of water with an underwater speaker that you can play back sounds to a fish. And then uh, using a recording electrode that goes just under the skin, so it doesn't go to the brain, it's just essentially touching the fish. Um, and this recording electrode is going to record the electrical activity of all of the um, neurons that might be firing if a fish is able to sense the sound. And what, what you do in these experiments is you play back the sound multiple times, and then you take an averaged response of what's going on in the fish. Um, and that's what I'm showing uh, on this next slide. There's, um, let me move this so I can see what I'm, what I'm pointing at. Uh, there are brain waves of two butterfly fishes, two coral reef fishes. And up at the top on the right side, you, if you see a big squiggle, that's because there's a large response because there's a loud sound. And in both of these experiments, we're gradually decreasing the uh, amplitude, the volume of the sound that we're playing back. And eventually um, that waveform is no longer visible. And when we can no longer detect a, a visible waveform at a particular frequency or pitch of sound, we uh, use that to identify the sound threshold. And 
if we do these kinds of tests on a fish at different frequencies, we can go to the uh, left side of the figure and look at um, what we call an audiogram of a fish. And in this particular figure, each of these um, uh, colored lines is representing a different species of butterfly fish. And each dot is the average sensitivity at a particular frequency. And one thing counterintuitive on these plots, which we call an audiogram, is that lower values on the y-axis indicate that the fish is more sensitive to sound. So that's the, that's the intensity of a sound where the fish can still um, detect it using this technique. And in reality, the fish is probably more sensitive than this technique. It's a, it's a bit of a simplification for how fish hear. But in doing these kinds of experiments, what you can see, for example, hopefully by looking at this plot, is um, some species are more sensitive than others. So for example, this forceps fish, which is the line in black, it's less sensitive than these other three butterfly fishes to sound at a particular intensity. And also there's no hearing thresholds detected over 800 Hertz. So it only hears lower frequencies as well. So doing these kinds of experiments, we can, we can find out that hearing, uh, even within a single family of fish is, is really variable. Other ways we can uh, try and deduce how well fish might hear is by looking at morphology of fishes. And so, um, as was mentioned, I spent two years uh, working at, at a lab uh, at the National um, Museum of Natural History in France. And on this uh, uh, opportunity, I was studying uh, morphology associated, so anatomy associated with hearing in different uh, fishes in the piranha and paku family, which are known to have relatively sensitive hearing, but it hasn't been studied in this family that has uh, around 90 species or so. And so uh, for this project, one of the things that we did is we recreated the skeletal anatomy of fish in the uh, natural history collection using um, high resolution CT scans. So higher resolution than you would do like at a, at a hospital. From that, you can recreate the skeletal anatomy of different fishes. And what you're uh, seeing on the, on the right of this uh, figure is um, just the cranium of the fish, just the neurocranium and the otolith, the hard structures are in color here. So we did this for um, about 25 species of, of piranhas and pacus, these uh, freshwater fishes from South America. And most of these fishes, if you look at their skull, behind the orbit of the skull where the eye is, is where the ear is. And they have a really large uh, bony covering surrounding one of the sense, uh, sensory uh, areas within the ear. And it's quite large on most of the fish, except for a few species that we examined that have really small ears. And you can notice that it's, it's much smaller in this region. The otoliths inside the ear are smaller, the overall size of the ear, and it uh, affects even the shape of the bone around the ear is smaller in these fishes. And all of those fishes that had this feature in, the, in our study uh, were associated with areas where you have rapids and waterfalls. So we hypothesized that maybe it's just a noisy environment where having sensitive hearing is, is not really tenable, it's not possible but we're, we're speculating based on morphology. So hopefully someday somebody will study hearing um, using um, the evoked potential technique described earlier so we could maybe confirm or, or refute this hypothesis because the fish do have very different uh, uh, size differences in their ears. Uh, so given that uh, fish hear, we might ask why not communicate with sound, right? So, and as you know uh, from the title of my talk, Some Fish Talk, um, I will say that most fish are not known to be vocal or to, to produce sounds to communicate. So when we think of a communication sound, we're talking about a sound, not like a feeding sound from the parrotfish, but a sound that we think is, is uh, an adaptation for um, actually communicating between fish with sound. So most fish, are not known to do this, but uh, fish are a very diverse group of animals, 30,000 species and counting. And we're finding that many, um, many uh, species within this minority group of, of uh, vocal fishes do produce sounds. 
And so the question is, how do they do it? And the reason this is of interest is because when we think of how uh, other vertebrates produce sounds, we, we tend to um, be thinking of terrestrial vertebrates in kind of three main mechanisms. So most mammals, for example, me talking to you, I'm using a mammalian larynx, this, this organ that's present as, as part of the sound production organ of a, of a mammal. Birds use a syrinx organ that's common to most uh, both songbirds and, and non-songbirds that, that produce um, air-driven sounds. And frogs and toads have an anner and larynx that they use that sort of functions um, in an analogous manner to our larynx. Uh, fishes, because only some fish produce sounds, they've evolved a lot of different ways to kind of solve that problem of making sound underwater. And one of the kind of best known examples of sound producing fishes involves fish that produce sounds with the swim bladder. And the swim bladder of a fish, if you're not familiar, is uh, a feature found in, in uh, many bony fishes, and it's a gas-filled organ that um, is often in, involved in buoyancy, so allowing the fish to regulate uh, its its buoyancy, keeping it from sinking. Uh, but because it's a different density than water, it's also an efficient sound radiator. So uh, fishes in uh, many families that produce sounds often have some kind of sonic muscle mechanism. And we see this in the croaker and drum family, for example. This is a, a sound from an Atlantic croaker, a local species that I recorded. It's a, a little fish in a bucket. Hopefully you could hear that. Um, and the, the figure on the left is from Connaughton et al. And it's, it's looking at a similar anatomy that's present in another member of the family, the weak fish, uh, an East Coast species. Other mechanisms though uh, exist in fish that, that um, produce sound in a, a different manner. And one sort of theme that we often see is stridulation or the grinding of hard parts. One example of this would be teeth grinding together. And a local example of this can be seen in the jack family. So jacks like pompanos and uh, uh, jack Preval and little jacks like Atlantic bumper produce sounds by grinding these teeth. So this is a, a bumper that I recorded in a bucket. Hopefully you can hear. And uh, the uh, jacks and, and bumpers are grinding uh, these teeth that exist in the back of the throat that are also used in feeding called pharyngeal jaws. These are present in many fish, and some fish that have this use them also to produce sounds. So these sounds might function to um, startle uh, other fish if there's a predator around to maybe create a disturbance. It's, it's not known in many uh, fishes exactly why they produce sounds. Uh, other examples of uh, sound producing fishes are uh, sea robins. Um, so the big head sea robin, for example, and uh, I can play the sound for you later if you're interested in interest in time. So uh, besides recording sounds in buckets, how do we actually study fish sounds? Um, one um, way that we were able to study fish sounds recently that um, was um, I was really uh, lucky to be a part of was a project that I worked on with Tim Trikas, who was my PhD advisor um, when I was a grad student at the University of Hawaii. And we worked on a project for two summers on the Kona coast of Hawaii, where we were trying to just record as many kind of coral reef sounds from fishes that we could in the field um, while diving and using video and a hydrophone. And for this project, we got to use um, uh, what's called a rebreather, which is different than regular scuba diving in that it recycles our, our breathing, uh, our, our exhaled breath, cleans out our carbon dioxide. And by doing this, it's a much more efficient way to use uh, the amount of gas, breathing gas that you take underwater. So you can do a three hour dive instead of a one hour dive. Uh, but more importantly, um, when you exhale, you're not releasing lots of bubbles. And scuba can be really noisy. So this was a much kind of quieter way to be uh, among the fish and try and record sounds. 
And so in doing this, we were able to kind of record a, a number of different kinds of reef fish sounds. Um, and I'll play a couple of these uh, videos before going on. Hopefully I can, I can not hide my uh, screen afterwards. <laughs> So um, the, the first one I'll show here is a, uh, a fish called um, uh, a soldier fish, an epaulette soldier fish. And this is a nocturnal species. So you can see it's got this really large eye. Um, this fish has sonic muscles that attach to a swim bladder um, that, that have been described um, in the study by Carmentier et al. And these fish will produce this um, the sound, the, this clicking sound that almost sounds like a Geiger counter when you swim up to them. Oops, wrong button. So hopefully um, you could hear uh, you could hear uh, that sound, that clicking sound of those fish. And hopefully you can see my screen too. Let me know if you can. <laughs> um, Part of this project that um, was most exciting to me was uh, we were able to record some sounds from fish that we didn't know made sounds and that um, people hadn't heard before as far as we know and fish that we didn't think were making sounds. One of these uh, species was uh, in a group of, of fishes I was studying for my dissertation research, which is the butterfly fish family. Uh, and uh, this is the pyramid butterfly fish. This is a group of pyramid butterfly fish at our study site. In fact, you can see some of them are swollen that we hypothesize were females. Um, we'd see this kind of condition on new moons and full moons when fish are often spawning. And we found that these fish would be making um, these pulse train sounds that are kind of similar to the soldier fish um, that was just uh, played before. Um, however, um, the mechanism in this particular group of fishes had not been examined before. So people knew, people already knew that some soldier fishes made sound. So this was um, exciting to us. And I'll briefly play one more video of this where you can hear uh, another reef sound here on the Kona coast of Hawaii. In this case, it's of these pyramid butterfly fish. There it is. So it's, again, it's a bit of a noisy video because we're in the field, you can hear us breathing, but you're gonna be listening for kind of like a drum, like brrr kind of sound. So um, 
after after we heard those sounds in the field, um, I was um, very, very excited about this um, and wanted to get these fish back to the lab where we could um, kind of study uh, study sound production in the lab and see if we could learn about the mechanism of how they produce these sounds. Um, and so to do this, um, we, we, we collected fish, brought them back to the lab, and they readily make sounds in an aquarium. So we could, um, we could record um, a fish making sound, we could observe it, and I'll play this through my screen. I'm not sure if you can see this, but in this area, if you can't, that's okay, I can describe this. On the side of the fish, there's a region of the fish that buckles inward when a sound is produced. And this video was shot actually um, at 600 frames per second. So um, seeing this kind of indentation in real time was actually very difficult because it just lasts a couple of milliseconds. So you don't actually, when you're watching the fish making a sound, you don't really see any movement. But when you slow it down with video, you could see that there's motion associated with the side of the fish. And this motion occurs between a gap between ribs on the side of the fish. And this is a, a specimen of, of fish where the, the fish has been cleared so that you can see inside of the fish and the bones have been stained with a red stain so that you can see the bone. And you can see on the side of these pyramid butterfly fish, there's actually a gap between the ribs and it's associated with a spot where this indentation was occurring. And right inside of this region is also where the swim bladder of the fish is. And so we did some experiments where we um, actually were able to record a sound producing fish and place a, um, a electromyographic electrode, an EMG electrode that measures electrical activity of muscles. And it's a way you can tell if a muscle is being activated by the nervous system to contract. And when a fish is producing a sound, both the right and left side of this musculature are contracting. So it indicates that this region is where the sonic muscles are on these fish that actually vibrate these ribs, they contract, and that vibrates the swim bladder underneath. And what's shown here is uh, a sound, a four pole sound from these fish, and both the right and left side of the musculature of the fish are contracting. And this was really exciting to us because um, in a closely related species, the forceps fish, sound production uh, was very different. These fish produce only a, a single kind of pop-like sound. And that pop-like sound is um, not produced by these muscles that exist in the pyramid butterfly fish and they're close cousins. They're in the same family. Um, these uh, forceps fish instead are producing a sound that's a, a single pulse sound that is produced when the fish um, is actually lifting its head. So the mechanism is very, very different in these fish. Um, and let's see if I can show you this, show this video as well. So. I'm going to try and play this through the, the screen because I was having trouble earlier. Um, and if you if you don't see it, I'll just describe it. But it's going to play three of these kind of pop sounds that exist, and then it's going to play a slowed down version. And what you should look for is what the fish does with its head when it's producing a sound. So in case you couldn't see that, it's very uh, it's very easy to imitate. It's a very it's a sound that's very simple. It's just a pop pop. And what's difficult to see in real time is the fish actually lifts its head very rapidly, associated with each one of those pop sounds. And this is a fish that's territorial, and both males and females produce this sound when they're defending a territory. And we um, hypothesized that the mechanism of producing sounds in these fish is very different. So muscles that are typically involved with raising the head and feeding in fishes might be involved. We know that the, the fish is lifting its head in each one of these sounds. But another thing that we observed by looking at many uh, high-speed video sequences is that the motion associated with 
the head actually occurs um, many um, milliseconds later than the sound is actually emitted. So what we think is that it's actually a byproduct of the sound production mechanism. So these fish produce a sound that contract muscles that lift the head, keep their jaws closed, and doing this stretches the swim bladder, which is outlined on this, um, on this fish where you can see its skeleton, and that stretches the swim bladder. So a simple model of that. The, the head just barely moves enough to pull the swim bladder uh, attached to the body behind it. And then after muscles are, are no longer tense, um, the head is kind of free to, to swivel uh, upward as a byproduct of sound production. And in these fish, we find that bigger fish produce louder sounds. So uh, because we know this is territorial uh, behavior, and what this figure is showing is, is fish length on the x-axis here, the horizontal axis, and the vertical axis is the intensity of sound. Bigger fish produce louder sounds. And that's each one of these dots is the kind of average sound intensity uh, of a sound of a given fish. And that means um, a fish, if a fish is able to ascertain how loud a sound is, it might be able to recognize um, a potential competitor, how, what kind of risk it would be to have a, a more um, intense fight with that fish besides sound production if it escalated into fighting as, as can sometimes happen. So the sound might be a way to be a potential honest signal. That's a hypothesis that needs to be tested to be validated. So um, how can we use sounds to study fish behavior in the wild? Um, one way we can, do, uh, we can do this now that's becoming um, easier and easier is to take a long-term acoustic recorder, a passive acoustic recorder, which is an autonomous device with a, a recording equipment, a hydrophone and power supply, and you can leave it in an environment and program it to turn on and off to save batteries and save, um, extend the life of this recorder in the field, and you can record sound at, at a particular habitat. And so recently we've been doing this on uh, artificial reef habitats um, in uh, northern uh, Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Alabama with uh, Sean Powers in the Fisheries Ecology Laboratory at uh, University of South Alabama. And we've placed uh, recorders in different kinds of artificial reefs that are intentionally placed by humans to attract um, fishes for uh, recreational fishing opportunities largely, largely for red snapper and, and other fishes like gray trigger fish. But these reefs attract a number of, of different kinds of reef animals and fishes, and they're different types. There's pyramid reefs, there's chicken coops that used to be, they're kind of repurposed chicken coops that uh, now are, are fish attraction devices and old army tanks. And so we use these recorders to kind of look at the question, how can the soundscape of a different reef um, maybe vary by reef type? Do pyramids sound different than chicken coops? Perhaps because they have a, a different suite of fish species living on them. And also how do these things change over time? And are the soundscapes influenced by the kind of species that live there? And so in doing this kind of research, we've identified a number of different kinds of fish sounds. Um, in, the, in the interest of time, I won't play these, but I can play them later for you, or you can contact me if you wanna hear these. Um, some of them, like the leopard toadfish, you can see its spectrogram here, we recognize because it's similar to other toad fishes, so we, we can tell it's a toadfish, and this is the, the type of toadfish we see offshore, as opposed to um, like gulf toadfish in a more inshore environment. And uh, we knew there were cocoa damselfish, and damselfish sounds have been fairly well studied. Uh, but we also see a number of fish sounds that uh, are from species that, as far as we know, the, the sound production hasn't been described, like these pulse train sounds, perhaps is another type of sound these toadfish make, thud sounds and pop sounds. And um, in our effort to place these kind of multiple recorders on different reefs um, during summer months, we've been able to compare kind of the relative occurrence of these kinds of sounds on different reefs. So uh, 
bear with me. Um, this graph is not as complicated as it might first look. The pictures on the left, the pyramids, the chicken coops, the bridges, and the tanks, each one of these rows across is a different reef. The columns are four different kinds of sounds. So there's the leopard toadfish sound, the pulse train sound, the thuds, and the pops. And um, on the x-axis for each one of these columns is a 24-hour cycle. So what we've done here is we've summarized how many fish sounds we could count of each of these types over a daily period. And the, the period in gray corresponds to nighttime, the yellow is the daytime. And these recorders were going continuously for seven and a half days, so we don't have time to listen to all of this and count. Um, so we can come up with uh, computer-aided algorithms to find these kinds of sounds. And what's immediately obvious is each one of these reefs has a different soundscape in terms of these uh, specific sounds. So for example, one of these bridges had a huge abundance of leopard toadfish calls, um, also pretty high abundance on two of the tanks. And most of those sounds are occurring at night, right? Not during the daytime. And that makes sense with what's known for other toadfishes. And in doing this, we can also see re which uh, reefs have kind of more pop sounds and more thud sounds. Um, we've also had the opportunity to put out um, a few recorders over a longer term and a, a second season of doing this research. Um, this was done in 2018 uh, at two reefs over 40 day period. And what you can see between these two reefs is the number of leopard toadfish detections is very different between the two reefs. So uh, this tank reef had far more detections. And over this 40 day period in the summer, you can also see that it's not homogeneous across these 40 days. It's really um, kind of intense in June, and there's a big gap, and then it, it picks up again in July. And sound production in toadfish is, is known to be more prevalent in male toadfish, um, and male toadfish um, court females with sounds and defend nests with sounds. So it's possible that this is correlated with reproductive activity in a specific time. Um, on some of these reefs, there's also a number of species of, of potential conservation interest, like um, invasive species like lionfishes and this kind of um, recent, um, recent introduction to the Gulf of Mexico, the regal damselfish. Um, damselfishes are known to produce sounds, but it's, it's not yet known if this species produces sounds. And there's a, we've also seen kind of rare and, and, and in some cases protected species like Goliath groupers, which are known sound producers on some of these reefs. So we're, this, this project's kind of ongoing, but we're hoping we can use this to potentially identify, um, you know, are some reefs uh, different in their soundscape because they have these fish present and they're not present on other reefs. And maybe sound could be used as a way to monitor who's who's present on different reefs. Um, and then, so lastly, I uh, want to close on kind of the, perhaps what I should have started with, which is why is it important to know how fish use sounds? Um, and the reason it's important is because it's getting noisier underwater and it's getting noisier underwater because of us humans. So these are all uh, covers of, of papers I was not involved with, but other other um, other authors that have done some nice studies showing that noise is increasing in oceans and aquatic habitats from human activity like vessels and construction and and uh, energy exploration. And the the reason it's important we know this is because we're still kind of grasping at how um, different kinds of fish and animals here underwater and how they use sound. Um, I uh, recently um, got um, interested in this, um, moving to the Gulf of Mexico, listening to different estuarine coastal habitats and hearing big choruses of fish in the croaker and drum family. So the, the, the family of black drum and redfish. Uh, and I'll play an example of this sound, a silver perch, which is in this in this family. It's a great fish that produces this uh, amazing sound in March um, during spawning aggregations when male fish produce this sound, presumably to court females for spawning. So 
So that's probably one male. And in the late afternoon, you might hear that sound. Um, in the evening, it, it builds into a big chorus if you have a large spawning aggregation. And in areas where you have a lot of vessel traffic, these spawning males might be making the sound, and presumably there's females listening to these males, and it's occurring while there's vessel traffic. So these boxes on the spectrogram are highlighting um, silver perch sounds, and um, you see a spectrogram there. The street going across is the sound from a, a large vessel. So hopefully you can still you can still make out the fish, but it's harder because there's vessel noise. So it might be masking it. It masks it for us. It masks it for the hydrophone. It uh, needs to be determined whether or not it's masking it for the the fish's actual ear. And vessel noise can in this same spot in Alabama can be much much louder. And the potential impacts for these fish are really largely unknown. And from what we already know about fish sounds and hearing being variable, these impacts might not be the same for all kinds of sound producing and even non-sound producing fish. So um, in, in the, the lab that we're building here, um, kind of research plans for our lab going forward, we're really interested in how does repeated vessel noise exposure impact hearing in fishes. Um, because every time a loud boat goes by in one of these spawning aggregations, you have male and female fish that are actively listening for other fish, and they're getting exposed to this noise. So we want to look at hearing impacts for noise exposure in fish, and um, a new master's student in the program, Gina Bidlowski, is going to be working on this topic. She's kind of getting this ready um, now that we're, we're kind of just moving back into the lab now, so we're really excited about this and her project. And how does noise impact sound producing fish? Do they change their behavior? Are they heard when they're kind of trying to talk over this kind of loud background noise? So really excited about this going forward. And that's, that's what I hope to be doing here in Louisiana um, very soon. So um, with that, thank you for your attention. That's, that's the end of, end of my part before questions. So hopefully you have some questions. We do, we have lots of questions uh, that came in during your presentation, but also um, they're starting to roll in now. Um, Thanks for being patient with my, um, my <laughs> lack of technical prowess too. <laughs> it's new technology, you have to learn it. Um, if it's okay with you, Kelly, I'd like to make the offer for people to stay just a little bit longer after we're done with questions and I will try to play some of those sounds. I'm not sure how it'll go, but I can try to play them um, with a little bit more uh, volume for people. We can just oh, okay. try it yeah. and see how or it I goes. I can imitate okay. them for you if you want. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Leopard toe fish, go. No, just kidding. Just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> um, so we'll start with the questions, and there's a lot of questions, you guys, so we'll take as many as we can. Um, and then, um, if you have questions that you want answered after we're done, um, you can email me using the email that was attached to your registration, which is education at lumcon.com, or you can use the mcon over at lumcon. I'm sorry, not dot com. Education at <laughs> lumcon.edu or mcon over at lumcon.edu. So if you have any questions, I can get those to Kelly, and I'm sure Kelly would be more than happy um, to yeah. answer any unresolved questions you may have. So um, our first question comes from Lee Hunt, the critic of my the critic of my joke telling. Um, he would like to know what is the largest marine organism you've ever heard? Largest marine organism I've ever heard. I'm not sorry, just not to fix anything. Uh, I guess uh, that I personally heard is humpback whales, which I played. And um, if you're swimming in, I, I've only heard them in in, um, in the Hawaiian Islands because, and they're really abundant there in the winter. So I was fortunate to live there for a number of years as a grad student. If you're swimming in winter in the right spot, you can easily hear it just with your own ear without a hydrophone or very special equipment. They're quite loud. That's awesome. So. 
Jonathan would like to know how um, snapping shrimp produce sound. So yeah, that's uh, hopefully I say this right because I don't study them, but I hear we hear them all the time if you're doing any kind of acoustics work in the marine environment. Uh, there's an enlarged claw that I think is specialized for producing those sounds. And I know that there's some very interesting research by others that, that look at the biomechanics of these claws. I think they can cavitate water even, they, they move so quickly. So I'm sure probably people at LUMCON know this much better than me. So maybe Stephanie Archer or <laughs> Dr. Archer. Let's, let's pick on Stephanie. Thursday seems to be <laughs> pick on Stephanie night. <laughs> Well, they live in sponges, I know, so. <laughs> uh, Tori would like to know um, when, how difficult it would be to overstimulate a fish's hearing ability and render, render it basically deaf. Um, yeah, is that possible? So that, I mean, those are the kinds of questions where we're, we're um, planning on working on, and there's people that are studying that have studied this in pretty good detail in, in some uh, other fish species, like um, lab model species, for example, like zebra fishes. Um, and fishes, um, unlike mammals, it, at least some fishes regenerate the hair cells in their ears. So that's one kind of positive thing for a fish is that it might have damage maybe temporarily that it could recover from in some cases. But really intense sounds might be, have even other consequences besides damaging hair cells like um, traumatic injury to the ears or even to the swim bladder of the fish. So that's something we wanna kind of get at with some of these non-model fish that we know are exposed to these sounds because we hear them with the hydrophone and then we hear the boat go by just whether or not um, some of these potential exposures might have permanent effects. And um, I think it's, uh, it might depend on the species, but these, these sounds can be pretty loud, so. Great. Um, Jonathan would like to know if uh, fish hearing is altered above the water, like are they rendered, um, da essentially they can't hear above the water? Do they rely on that dense environment? And these are these are great questions. So I know of one study that looked at this in, in mud skippers, to a little goby fish that crawl out on land, uh, and, and mud skippers make sounds actually too. Uh, and I think in that study they uh, they were pretty close to to deaf in terms of what the ear was was sensing, but maybe they were using touch and vibration on on a mud flat and things I think they thought but uh, I need to I need to double check on that I need to reread those papers but for fish that aren't always exposed I don't think it's been studied so much it could be kind of interesting because there are other fish that are out on land sometimes but maybe I'm not aware of some studies too so it's possible people are looking at it because it's a really interesting question Perfect. Um, Stephanie actually has a question about um, the popping noise from the artificial reefs, and she wants to know if you are certain those popping noises are coming from fish, um, because she's heard them on our similar sounds on rocky reefs and sponge reefs in British Columbia, and she thinks that that might be an invertebrate. I'm not, um, that's a, yeah, uh, uh, an interesting question. I never feel 100% sure until we have something in the lab. So um, the reason I suspected they were fish is they're lower frequency than snapping shrimp that we also heard at some of these sites, for example, but perhaps it's another invertebrate that I'm not aware is making sounds in these situations. So they're, they're high, they're relatively high frequency sounds for a fish. Because a lot of fish hear relatively low frequencies, the sounds many fish make are also low frequency, but they're not higher than sounds that all fish make. So they're kind of similar to the soldier fishes in Hawaii that make those um, click-like sounds, um, but those soldier fish are not 
um, present that we're aware of in, in Alabama. They're unusual in Alabama. They're, they're more restricted to the tropics. So it's, it's possible. Perfect. Uh, and she, she also uh, supplied some uh, clarification on the question of the snapping shrimp. And she See, said, it's, it. <laughs> <laughs> she's a wealth of information. Uh, she says it's the, it's the actual popping of the cavitation bubble. That's really cool. <laughs> that is actually really cool. Um, Claire has a question about how you determine that a sound is a fish sound versus sounds made by or other organisms. So it's along the same lines. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a uh, it's very challenging to do that sometimes in the field because the speed of sound underwater is is much it's over four times faster than in air. So with a single hydrophone, and particularly when we're recording these low frequency sounds that have really long wavelengths, determining the direction is really tricky. So one thing sometimes you can do is you can put out multiple hydrophones and you can locate a source by where it's coming from. And then if you have some other information like on this one rocky promontory on a reef, there's a school of fish that you think are the fish making the sound, you, you limit sort of potential alternatives. But it can be tricky. So when we recorded fish in Hawaii, we were trying to um, correlate things with behavior. So that's we had video, but it limited us to working in daylight hours. So we get a lot of sounds from some of those nocturnal species. We're, we're pretty certain it's them because you put the, the camera in their face and then you get the sound. You don't get it otherwise. Um, but it means that we don't know what they're using those sounds for at night. Perfect. And um... We Hunt kind of has a had a question that would kind of follow up on that, and he he wants to know if um, the fish that you are recording in the field they make those sounds as, as just a response to having a hydrophone following them. So, it, it actually, in some cases, it it does seem to be it's a disturbance sound. And one thing about kind of the best known sound producing fishes. Not all of them, but many of them will make a disturbance sound. And now we know that they also use sounds for some other probably more frequent behavior in their natural life history. Like a toadfish might make a disturbance sound if you handle it, it will bark. But they also make this boat whistle sound associated with their reproductive behavior. Great. Uh, the pyramid butterfly fish that I talked about makes a disturbance sound. The forceps fish that has the head bob behavior doesn't make that sound. You can't, you have to have another fish present or it won't make the sound. So it's. Perfect. Um, Becca, I think that answers your question, but if not, um, send me another question <laughs> um, and help me clarify if that did actually answer your question. Um, Jill had a question about. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, she says, you mentioned that not many fishes are known to be sound producing, but how much of that is what we haven't had a hydrophone or a diver in the water here? In other words, what percentage of fishes do you suspect are actually producing sound? Yeah, that's, uh, I should have a revised estimate for what um, people I know that have tried to kind of review this, what, what it is. I said it's a minority, but it is, I think it's 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 in the thousands of species we suspect. So so it's actually a large number of species, but just fish are really diverse. And I'm sure it's biased on what's been attempted to be listened to. And in the Western Atlantic and, and Gulf of Mexico, uh, Marie Fish and William Mowbray, it's maybe one of the best studied areas in terms of just trying to categorize marine fish. Uh, is they had a big effort from the 1950s into 1970 of categorizing and, and recording fish of uh, sounds of different fishes. So that's one reason why we know what a silver perch sounds like and we can put a hydrophone in and identify it because of work that they've already done. Um, but we need to listen to more fish to really get at that. That's a, that's a great point. Um, let's see, where did I leave off? Um, 
Using a hydrophone, could you determine if oil platforms have reef fish communities specific to the sounds each pl platform uniquely produces? So uh, just to clarify that you mean the, the sounds that the fish are producing on the platform or sounds from the platform itself or? Um, I'm, I'm interpreting in Elaine, if I'm wrong, uh, please let me know, but I'm interpreting it. Can you, can you identify like spe species, uh, community populations based on the sounds you're hearing? Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's, um, there, there's people actively trying to look at that kind of question. Um, and even some folks using maybe a different approach where they're, they don't even necessarily know what's making the sound, but trying to mathematically correlate other kind of more complex features of the soundscape you put a recorder out there and and what does how does sound look out look like over maybe a broad period of time and if you have more energy and kind of these low frequencies is that associated with species x so that's a, a question that many of us are interested in but it's um still i think kind of challenging until we look at more more areas to know um, and that that's kind of what we're getting at with the those alabama reefs too uh, they weren't platforms but it's many of the same fish species that you find on them um we're going to take one last question this one's coming from sam and uh sam is wondering if schooling fish have distress sounds for when they see a predator coming like I know chickens have a call they make when they see a hawk. So I wonder if uh, fish have something sim similar. So uh, that's um, been a thought, for example, with soldier fishes and squirrel fishes like I played, which isn't a, a big, big schooling fish, but they do live in shoals. And Mike Salmon in the 60s put a, a predator in an aquarium and they started to make a certain kind of sound more frequently when they're in the presence of a a moray eel, so it's it's definitely a possibility that there are startle sounds. And one hypothesis is that there's bubble sounds released, uh, for example, from menhaden and pogies and things in schools, and maybe they can listen to those sounds and it's a sign of of you know a, a potential threat or something because they have acute hearing, they, they have sensitive hearing, so they would be able to hear that really easily. That's great. So that was our last question for tonight, you guys. Like I said, if you want to hang out and try a little sound experiment with me, um, I will try to um, broadcast some of the interesting audio that Kelly had to share um, that didn't come over quite as well as we would have had hoped. Um, but I have a new mechanism, so we're going to try it. I'm Great. not guaranteeing there won't be feedback. <laughs> But we're gonna give it a go anyway. Uh, let's see. Which one should we start with, Kelly? Um. So, with uh, you, did you have tr you had trouble hearing uh, uh, the leopard toadfish, for example? That's a. We did, and that's actually a really cool one. So. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. So that. Okay. Let me see if I can click it. Oh, I could hear it. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? All right. You know what? I'm going to turn your all your mics on. So if you want to chime in uh, using your mics, you can do that too. Great. Thanks for letting me know. I'm going to play it one more time because it is actually my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn it just a little bit louder and see what we get. So that was the leopard toadfish. Which one would we like to hear next? Um, the, the pulse train sound, I think is what I called it, is kind of interesting. Um, one idea, it's possible that it's another toadfish sound within the same species because oyster toadfish, for example, make a uh, a non-boat whistle call that might be kind of similar, but um, I don't think anybody studied this in, in leopard toad fish. Sounds good. And let's see what we have.
that's re that's really cool. <laughs> um, I I really like the silver perch one. So should I play the silver perch quiet and then one with the vessels? Um, sure. Yeah. The I the silver perch quiet is much more pleasant in my opinion. <laughs> you can imagine that vessel sound. So that was the silver perch alone. And then um, here's the silver perch with a vessel. Should I do the loud one or the quieter one? <laughs> uh, it's up to you, but I'll warn people with the loud one. It, yeah, it's, it's kind of, um, it's not so nice. <laughs> All right, you guys, we're going to go with the not so nice one. And then we'll All right, go with yeah, the just experience nice it. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's just the kind of educator I am. That's like fingernails on a chalkboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not. Um, you, you, you have you have your. I'm sorry. You have earphones on too. That's not good. <laughs> oh, actually, they're unplugged. I don't know why okay. I leave them on. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, I should have warned you. Yeah, we're concerned about hearing, and you're listening to. <laughs> Okay, we won't listen to that one for a second time, but here's a silver perch with a quieter vessel. Um, Jill actually chimed in with another question. She's asking, oh, are there examples of fish species that utilize more than one mechanism of sound production? Oh yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, there are some um, many um, catfishes are are really pretty remarkable in this area. Uh, not this, I mean cat catfishes around the world. Many, not all of them, but here um, in Louisiana, the sea catfishes, the hardhead and the gaff top have a, a mechanism to vibrate the swim bladder, but catfishes also squeak their um, pectoral spines. So that's kind of two different ways of making a sound. And in um, some freshwater tropical systems, it's been hypothesized that maybe when they make distress sounds that one might be better for a terrestrial predator like a heron, a wading bird, and one might be better for an aquatic pet predator that hears low frequency swim bladder sounds. So there are a few that can do that. That's great. Um, Stephanie um, is supplying a link to the discovery of sound in the ocean. Oh, yeah. Um, site. So I am going to send that to everybody in the question box. Hopefully it gets to everyone. Um, so you, sh you guys should have that link now, hopefully, um, let me know if you did get it. If not, we can put that link, um, up and on our website, right where we're going to link to the recording of Kelly's talk, um, so that you can get there. Cause it is a, it is a fantastic, um, it's a great resource and they're, they're always updating it and things too. Yeah. I meant to include that actually. Thank you. Do you work with them at all, Kelly? Uh, I know some of the people that have contributed to it, but I haven't personally, um, I haven't personally, but I'd love to if they ever. <laughs> um, I'm gonna play the snapping shrimp audio because I know my staff needs to hear that because um, oh, we're okay. out in the field all the time. <laughs> yeah. And I and I'm not really sure if we're hearing it when we're hearing it. Um, and, and it may sound a little, it's, that's very dense compared to what I've heard in Alabama. That's recorded in uh, Hawaii. So there's 
maybe high density of them. I'm not sure. It's really noisy at night. So I know um, when we have summer camps, um, we're on the dock at night a lot with the kids, and we we hear some of this. So cool. I'm gonna play it again. That's great. It really does sound like frying bacon. Yeah. <laughs> And then, of course, the bumper, because that blows my mind. The yeah, bumper. yeah. And it just, uh, you don't have to touch them or anything, but if there's a hand in a bucket, they start, and you could probably hear it through the bucket. They're pretty loud. For my staff are on, um, this is this is a shock to me. We have them in buckets all the time. And I <laughs> bumper uh those are from a beach scenes uh, that maybe this this long total length i don't think they were too big there were two or three in there i never heard that that's awesome so, can imagine what like a, a a bigger jack might i'm assume be louder but i don't know i've never and then how about the eel the cusk eel from the, yeah, so um, I should mention, so that's a fish. Sorry. <laughs> we think it might be a cusk eel based on the, on the sound. Um, and uh, my first postdoc advisor uh, um, studies cusk eel sounds, but mostly European cusk eels. Um, so we're, we're kind of just guessing, but those sounds are really common on around some of the reefs at night. If it's a cusk eel, it's not a reef associated fish, but there's a lot of sand environment around the reef, so it, it sounds similar to a cusk eel. But, okay, you they guys get really, really loud after uh, once it gets darker. So I'm gonna play it a couple of times. That is just awesome. <laughs> It sounds like an eel. That's how I wanted eels to sound. <laughs> cool. Those are really awesome audio files. Thank you for oh, sharing thanks. them. Yeah, no, no problem. Thank, thank you all for the great questions and for sticking around, um, putting up with with me struggling with the videos and stuff. Appreciate it. You did. You did a fantastic <laughs> job. Thank you so much, Kelly. That it thank was you, a great. It was so much fun, thank you. And uh, for my audience that are still out there, remember if this was your 10th talk, you'll be getting a challenge coin in the mail. Um, I have mailed a couple of challenge coins for those of you who, uh, who earned them last week. So keep coming back and earn those RV Pelican Challenge Coins. And Stephanie, you have earned yours and I will put yours in your mailbox at work. <laughs> and with that, I will see you all um, next Thursday, I hope. Have a great week. Stay safe. Science on, my nerd friends. <laughs> Good night. Good night.